My research presentation this year is a little different than what I've done in the past. I mean, last year I was using uh, graph analytics to do uh, some complex uh, uh, picture clustering by 14 different attributes, and two, in, including two and three pitch sequences. This year I've gone sort of completely the other direction and done something. I'm going to make a research presentation at an analytics conference without any numbers in it. Uh, but the reason I wanted to study this topic is because I don't frankly think the topic of team chemistry or clubhouse chemistry uh, gets the kind of credit it deserves for its impact on the game in terms of on individual and team performance. Um, I want you to know I'm collaborating with a gentleman named Jeff Miller. He was actually a presenter at, the, at our conference last year. Jeff is the mental skills coach of the, uh, the Atlanta Braves. And uh, Jeff and I, are, uh, we had this idea to work on this project and are, as I say, collaborating on it together. I'm considering this a progress report because I'm really kind of midway through it. Um, so, so why study team chemistry? Uh, well, first of all, many people, almost everyone in the game today, people who work for teams, people who are in the clubhouse, players in uniform, past players, will tell you that they have strong conviction that it impacts results. Um, I also think, frankly, it's, it's probably undervalued by the analytics community. Um, I think there, there tends to be a mindset of if we can't measure it, it doesn't count. Now, I don't believe people believe that literally because I think we're all smarter than that. But I do think we tend to diminish its importance because it's not been measured or it's difficult to measure. There's really been no in-depth analysis done. I mean, there's been some nice pieces in the uh, analytics media. Uh, I know Russell Carlton has done some fine work on the topic. Uh, but there's no, not been really any in-depth analysis done as it pertains to baseball. And it's something that's been studied really extensively in the, in the business world uh, in terms of organizational behavior, organizational development, organizational dynamics. It's a major field of study in human resources. And I think there's some things we can borrow from those learnings and sort of test them as it pertains to baseball. Um, and since there hasn't been much done, perhaps my work can begin to lay some uh, groundwork for some, for some future study. Um, so the agenda, what I'm going to walk you through today is I'm going to talk about the objective of the study, um, talk about this three-pronged approach that I'm taking, define team chemistry so that we can perhaps, uh, you know, coalesce around a, a common vocabulary for what it is. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit some top-line findings, but also then delve deeper into some key questions, things like, well, why is chemistry so important in baseball? Um, what is the payoff from good chemistry? Uh, what about this player life cycle? My feeling, and I think one that was popularly held among people I spoke with, is that there is a natural life cycle to when a player is more likely to be a catalyst for team chemistry and fully engaged in, in sort of team. Um, why, it's, why I think chemistry is a much more important issue today than it was 10 or 20 years ago, and a model and a framework for how it, how it all sort of fits together. Um, and then some preliminary conclusions, and then some next steps. So again, the goal of the study is to define it and, and really, uh, you know, as I say, create a common vocabulary and a place, uh, start to place some definition and structure around this otherwise pretty amorphous topic. I mean, I've, I've heard the word um, happy uh, thrown around with team chemistry quite loosely uh, over time, and, and, over time. And, and I think, frankly, that the word happy probably doesn't have a real place in, in, the, in the rigorous analysis of the concept. I think it's probably a bit too trite to really sort of make the cut. So I think I'll be able to take it you know, clearly beyond that. But, but I want to develop a framework for how it works and hopefully expand our understanding on the topic. And while I don't have measures here today, I definitely have some, some thoughts on that. Um, and I think there's a way that we can create some hypotheses that, that, can, be, that can be tested. So, so my approach is really three-pronged. Number one, to interview, in-depth interviews with players, coaches, managers, and front office personnel. Um, I, I've conducted over 20 hours of interviews to date and intend uh, clearly to do more. The players range from active players uh, to recently retired players, to players who may have been retired as probably no one who's been retired longer than, 
then uh, 12 or 15 years is probably as far back as I've gone. So I haven't really had a conversation in depth with what we would call the, the old timers, but clearly uh, current players and recently retired players. Um, I've also surveyed the findings in the business literature and all the studies that have been done and have, have a, a little quick synopsis of that. And also I looked into military studies. There are some interesting work that's been done on the notion of social cohesion in the military, and I think it has uh, uh, some, some bearing on, on, on the baseball world. And then finally, drawing on some personal experiences from, from the corporate world. I spent 20 years uh, at a company, PepsiCo, and uh, I was part of uh, high-performing, successful teams, and I was also part of dysfunctional teams that, that failed and, and didn't, didn't capitalize on the opportunities that faced them. And I, I wanted to test and see how much of of my personal experiences and learnings that I experienced are translatable. And, and I think what we'll find is that clearly some are, but there's some distinct differences as well. So in terms of a definition, here's my working definition. The degree to which players are invested in their teammates and embrace a shared set of team-oriented goals, including a willingness to make sacrifices for the good of the team. So really, that's my shot at a definition, and I've sort of vetted this with some of my interviewees, and, and there, there's a sense that you know, this is, again, work in progress still. I, I will cycle back through everything I talked to you about today and to continue to refine it, but that's kind of where I am now. So think about it as the interpersonal relationships within the team and within an entire MLB organization that impact the team, because the the relationships at the front office level that don't even involve, involve uniform uh, uh, players or coaches or managers has a big effect on, on clubhouse chemistry, or certainly can. So, you know, just quickly some top line findings and then we'll drill deeper. First of all, you know, to a person, players believe clubhouse chemistry and climate has a real impact on performance, and I'll talk about the ways in which they think it impacts it. Uh, uh, briefly or in a few more minutes. Um, support from teammates is viewed as an integral part of success in baseball. And I say for most. Clearly, if someone has elite Hall of Fame talent, it might impact them, but it might not be detectable because they're so extraordinarily talented. So I'm not saying everyone has to feel supported and nurtured to be a star player, but what I am saying is that for you know, 90% of the players in the game today, uh, team chemistry is a real tangible force in helping them realize their potential. There's that, I don't know, five or 10% that's gonna, gonna get it done regardless because they're just so off the charts talented. Front office and the manager and the coaching staff definitely play a key role, which I'll talk about more specifically. There is a natural life cycle to a player's role uh, the difference between a team chemistry catalyst, in other words, a person who contributes in a very positive way to the chemistry of the team, and someone with good makeup, are, are two different things. Uh, and, and then finally, there are probably more similarities than differences between, between the business world and, and baseball. So those are just at the very sort of 20,000 foot top line level. But I wanna, I wanna drill, uh, drill deeper now into some of the questions that I think are really, uh, really important. Um, first, I want to talk about, um, I, I came away that it's, believe, that it's a myth uh, believing that baseball lacks the kind of interdependence on the field, right? No one has to pass me the ball. I'm going to get my turn at the bat. No one has to block for me when I drop back to pass. It's not a team game in that sense. I mean, clearly on defense there's some of that and the pitcher-catcher relationship. But it is more of a one-on-one -on -one game. But I will argue that because of the construct of the game, team chemistry may be more important, not less important. Um, also, what are the traits in, in, uh, of good and bad chemistry players and good and bad chemistry teams? Uh, what is the role of managers, coaches, and front office? Are the clubhouse leaders more typically stars versus bench players, young players versus veterans, dugout, people who are spending their time in the dugout, or people who spend their time during the game in the bullpen? What is the payoff from great team chemistry? Is there a natural life cycle? And again, a model of how it works. So be, just before I get into the details of all that, let me just comment on 
on the corporate business environment and also on, uh, on, the, on the military studies, just a, really a, a page each. But in terms of the, the corporate um, in, environment, uh, one of the key qualities of a high performing team is accountability, right? So it's taking responsibility for your performance and results, but also holding your peers accountable for their results as well. This is a critical attribute and success and function of anything that, that we would call a team in a, in a business setting and also a team in a, in a baseball or sports setting. Um, positive conflict. You know, one of the signs of good chemistry in a clubhouse or in an office is when someone calls out their teammate. And I use the word calls out. Now, this can be done in productive ways, constructive and productive ways, when they fail to give effort. In a business setting, it might mean when they fail to make a, uh, make a deadline, okay? Missing a deadline so you let the rest of your team down and didn't deliver something to the client or the customer, perhaps. Um, uh, you know, letting things go, glossing over problems is a classic sign of bad chemistry. It's not caring enough or not having the relationship or the mutual respect or the trust to, in fact, be able to call someone out. Again, I, I probably not even a good choice of words, call out but have a conversation with someone in a productive way. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to a, um, uh, a, a current active player who described a situation in detail to me last year where he had to pull a guy aside after he, had, he was lifted for a pinch hitter and threw a tantrum in the dugout. And he pulled him aside and said, you know, let me tell you how we behave around here and let me tell you what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And from that point forward, he never heard it, he never heard it again or saw any of that behavior. That player was a young player who needed a veteran to tell him that. Now, in, in bad chemistry clubhouses, there's, there's a little bit more of everybody for themselves attitude, and the, the, the veteran player may not have been in a teaching mindset and may not have, been, may not have felt it was worth it to take the time to call out that, that teammate. A third thing is, um, you know, proactively supporting team members. So in both environments, both business and in, uh, in, a, in a team setting, uh, you know, going out of your way to support comes in the form of coaching and skill building. It might, it might come in the form of emotional or psychological support as well. So both of those are important. One of the real important characteristics that I heard consistently in a, in a positive clubhouse and most of the, by, by the way, most of the players I interviewed had experiences in, in positive clubhouses and in at least clubhouses that were slightly negative. I, I didn't talk to anyone who was in, a, in, in what they would call a disaster situation, although I don't know uh, if they would have shared that with me anyway. But, uh, you know, but, I, but I think it was interesting to, uh, to hear them talk about the teaching mindset of a positive clubhouse versus the, well, I'm sort of in this for me and everybody goes their own way mindset of a clubhouse which, is, uh, which doesn't have that mindset. And then the final point here is this team versus individual. And this is where incentive systems and compensation systems are critical in a business setting to bring a business person's goals in line with the organization's goals. And, but also it's a challenge in baseball. When you think about it, you've got guys doing exactly the same job who are making 500,000 and are making 20 million. And, and there's, there's a dynamic there that's, that's tricky. And it it's, it's sometimes presents an issue in and of itself, but those are things that have to be dealt with in, a, uh, you know, in a, both a business and a team setting. You know, in terms of, I, I found some interesting insights from military and combat. And, and the first thing I wanna say right out of the blocks is in no way am I comparing baseball to combat, okay? I, I don't wanna, uh, uh, trivialize combat in any way, it's, it's life or death, literally. But we can learn from some of the factors that motivate and drive U.S. troops in combat from the extensive studies that have been done. Clearly the stakes are much higher, there's a greater inter interdependence in the, in the combat unit itself, the small combat unit. And the consequences of failure are the ultimate often. Uh, but what we learned was, in the studies that were done over the last four decades, five decades, is that social cohesion, the camaraderie and the belief, or I have your back, you have my back, trumps patriotism by a huge, huge margin in terms of our US fighting troops. I thought that was interesting. And it trumps all other forms of motivation. 
I mean, patriotism may be why they joined the military service, but when it gets down to combat, it's, it's, not even, it's not even on the radar screen compared to social cohesion. The other thing I found fascinating was that in a study of World War II deserters, the uh, primary reason for desertion when, it, when they were debriefed and analyzed was their inability to assimilate into their small unit. It wasn't lack of patriotism, lack of commitment to the cause, it wasn't lack of will, it wasn't, a, it wasn't fear, fear of their life, it was literally feeling alone, being part of a team, but feeling completely alone. I just thought that those were, um, you know, were, were two interesting or three interesting insights that, uh, you know, that could be, could be gleaned from this. So now, let's talk about why chemistry is important in baseball. So, you know, the interdependence is driven, I think, the interdependence and importance of team chemistry in baseball is driven by, by a couple different factors. One is the length and grind of the season. You know, we're talking about mid-February for pitchers, you know, late February, first of March for position players, uh, through uh, October, uh, well, through September for sure, and perhaps through October if you're fortunate enough to get to the postseason, which is, you know, now one-third of all teams. When you look at that grind and you look at the mental fatigue of that, I, I won't even talk about the physical fatigue, but you look at the mental fatigue and the duration of the season, uh, you know, I had one player say, I see my teammates way more than I ever see my family. And when you think of it that way, you know, think about the support we get from our family, and, and you think about how some of that need still exists, and if that doesn't come in the form of your teammates, it's, it's, it's potentially going to wear you down unless you are of the strongest of mental wills. So the, so the notion of being away from family and being with, uh, in, in the grind of the sport and the mental challenges. You know, baseball is an instant adjustment game. Adjustments within and at bat, right? And so that grind is something that, gr that dramatically benefits from what players have told me from support from teammates. And support, we'll talk about what forms it comes in, but it comes in many forms. Um, the other thing is the isolation of the batter-pitcher matchup. Even though you say, well, gee, it's a very self-reliant kind of thing, right? It's mano a mano, and it's me against him. But in reality, that whole structure of the game begs for a support system. It's sort of a paradox, right? So the paradox is, because of the one-on-one -on -one nature of baseball, your, your, your reliance on your teammates is even greater than it would be, perhaps, in other sports. Uh, you know, think of, think of the often reliance on teammates for insights and information. Guy comes off the field after grounding to short, and the first thing he's doing is he's talking to the guy on the on the on-deck circle, strutting up to the plate, gets back into the dugout. This is the first inning, the first time around with this pitcher. Everybody wants to know, what's he got? Where's he, how's he working? So that whole interdependence is just an example of how much uh, the, the interdependence does exist. And then again, these need to make frequent in-game adjustments. Uh, is, is another factor. So, so I think the notion that, well, gee, team chemistry isn't very important in baseball because you're not, I don't have to be, or be liked by you to get the ball from you is really a misnomer. It's the wrong way to think about it. Um, the, the next is, you know, I wanted to talk about the key qualities of a good chemistry team. They do mirror those qualities I was talking to you about a couple of pages earlier. Um, you know, so I won't hit on the ones that I duplicated uh, too, too, in too much depth, but clearly accountability. Uh, an organization where, where players don't hold themselves and others accountable. You know, this is where players start externalizing failure. You know, and you hear quotes in the media about, well, you know, I, you know, making excuses. Those are sort of bad telltale signs. Trust is critically important. When we're talking about, you know, 25 guys working together, the whole element of trust cannot be underplayed or, or cannot be overrated, I should say. The, the open communication uh, is, a, is another key factor. And this, by the way, is where I think the manager and the coaches really set the tone. But, but the, 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 having open communication in a good flow, both horizontally across teammates and vertically throughout the organization, is important. We're going to talk a little bit later about this notion of playing for the team versus playing for yourself, but that is clearly a quality 
of, of a good chemistry team. Um, and, and, you know, embedded in, in all of this is, is a selflessness. You know, one, one of my interview subjects said to me, you know, baseball is a very selfish game uh, in a way, uh, but, but you also have to be selfless to really be a great teammate and willing to make sacrifices for the team. And then finally, this sense of family, because in many cases, the, the, the ball club replaces family for an extended period of time. In terms of the role of front office manager coaches, clearly um, they set the tone for a, an environment where, uh, where a clubhouse would have good or bad team chemistry. They alone cannot control that, but they clearly set the tone. They also set the tone on communication, and it's really important from the people that I talked with that demonstrating alignment, okay, so so that the manager modeling that he is not in conflict with the front office, that he's not in conflict with his assistant GM and his GM. It's showing a, a, a front, a, a unified front where they're all on the same page. And by the way, I'm not suggesting he has to be an actor and fake it, because they'll see through that in a minute. I'm talking about legitimate, genuine alignment. So, so in organizations where you've got a highly analytical front office, and perhaps an old line manager who maybe is, is less resistant to some of the concepts that are coming down, that kind of friction and tension is felt at the team level. I've had a couple players talk about that, and it's an interference with team chemistry. I mean, it, it doesn't completely destroy it by any means, but it is a limiting factor, so you do want that alignment. And then there's this other aspect about uh, creating a higher purpose, and that higher purpose is winning. So the manager and the front office and the coaches really do play a role in elevating the players beyond self into team. And, you know, you think about it, the manager and the, and the coaches are really on the front lines. They're the, they're the people in the organization the players have the most direct contact with. So it, they, they shape their entire, those people shape the entire view of the players of the baseball world. So it's not surprising that their alignment and their, their relationships with their bosses have a critical impact on, uh, you know, on, on, on the whole topic. I want to talk a little bit about, about the payoff, uh, you know, and, and I want to make some sort of contrast between good chemistry environments and bad chemistry environments. And, and obviously, don't take these literally, take these as, as examples, as generalities. But in a, in a great chemistry environment, we're going to see highly motivated players. They're going to work longer hours. I, I had a player tell me, on this club, I get to the ballpark an hour and a half earlier every day than I used to. And he said, I don't think I was slacking off in the other, in the other situation. I just can't wait to get there with this club because I feel so good about the guys that I'm around and what we're building here. Um, you know, they, they work harder and they're better prepared. So what does he do in that hour and a half? He hits the weight room with his couple of his, uh, couple of his closer uh, guys on the team or they go out and, and, and take extra hitting, or they, or they work on some drills on the field or turning a double play. And he feels a strong sense of obligation to the organization, to his teammates, even to himself to be better at his craft. In a bad chemistry environment, you might see something like a guy who gets to the ballpark when he has to, no sooner, um, you know, not really putting in extra work, and, and there's a sense of real self versus an obligation to teammates, and that's the obligation to teammate thing is not, a, is not big in the hierarchy of, of, that, of that guy. Uh, you know, focus on helping. I mentioned it a couple of times, this teacher mentality that the clubhouse has in a positive environment. Um, you know, on, on teams with positive chemistry, players take personal responsibility for making their teammates better. I had a situation where one veteran player was sitting next to a young pitcher on the, on the bench in the dugout, and there was a stud pitcher on the mound, it might have been Scherzer or somebody like that, and he said, your stuff is as good as his. And, it, and if that had come from the manager or the GM, it might have been sort of, yeah, yeah. It came from a highly credible 15-year veteran who he was close with and he trusted, and he said, are you kidding? He says, no, your stuff is as good as his. What you saw happen was this young player begin to completely re-image, re, you know, create a, create a new self-image of himself and who he could become. He started working harder. He started asking more questions. 
I mean, it, it, was, it was one of those profound experiences. We'll, you know, we'll see someday if the player becomes the, the, the star that, that this guy thought he could be. But the point is, it had a tremendous impact on him. And there's also you know, a strong support system where you're picking up your teammates when, when, when they you know, screw up and make a mistake, strike out or, or, or ground out. You know, you're there to sort of pick up for them. Um, on the other side of the coin, you're looking at you know, uh, uh, failing to share experiences, no support system. I'm kind of an I'm in this alone vibe, just a little bit more of a detached sort of culture in the whole clubhouse where it's everyone for themselves. Um, you know, in terms of accountability, again, team leaders willing to productively confront teammates, um, players externalize failure, everybody avoids conflict. You know, it's not even worth it to go up to that guy and, said, you know, and say, that's not the way we do it around here because, I don't know, it's just not worth the hassle. Um, one of the things that someone said to me was, players giving kudos to their teammates in the media is, is a really positive sign. If someone is selfless enough to, to give credit to other people, his teammates, that's a good thing. Um, so there's a really a self-policing culture in a team, in a clubhouse with good chemistry. That's what this means on the left-hand side here. Um, and the final thing here is, is on the payoff is open communication. You know, players know where they stand. And with the organization, they know their role. You know, I think the days of the manager saying, well, let them, let's keep them guessing. I'll let them know when I'm ready to let them know what they're, where they're going to bat in the order today or when they're going to play or what their role is on this team. Th that's sort of, you know, sort of the old school way. That's not what seems to resonate today with players. Uh, players' uncertainty about role and where they stand is, 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 not, a good si is not a great sign of a, of a, positive, uh, of a positive clubhouse. And again, I, I want to emphasize the communication aspect is really set, that tone is set by the manager. I, I want to talk a little bit about creating this team mindset and this higher purpose. So, you know, how do you get players who are clearly playing, in part at least, if not mostly, for themselves? It's their career. Um, you know, how do you get them to, to think broader than themselves and think team and think winning? Well, you know, part of it is connecting to the team's history. And, um, you know, one of the things that's, that's really interesting is teams that have a lot of alumni present, present meaning living in town, frequenting, even hanging around the clubhouse. You know, the Red Sox have done a great job of this in the years when, when Pesky and Doerr and, and others and Ted Williams in his healthy days were around. But having those players around takes you, the player, out of yourself and brings you to something much, much bigger. So connecting with the history of your organization is an important aspect, and every MLB team has that, has that even the youngest of teams. Um, if, you, if you think about you know, the impact of winning on the city and its fans, you, know, you think about it, these are $200 million, $300 million businesses. In, in the business world today, that, that's, a, that's a very medium-sized business at most, right? But when you talk about the impact that a baseball team has, or any pro sports team really, on the citizens in its, its region of the country or its city. It's enormous. And when you, when you convey, when you get players to buy in to that they're not just playing for themselves, they're not just playing for their paycheck, they may not even just be playing for the legacy of their, of their team, but they're also playing for those you know, 40,000 fans that come to every game and the, and the three million folks in their city, then you start to create a sense of that if you can sell that in and build that. And also this notion that we are building something special here. I can tell you a quick story from my corporate days. I was, the, I was lucky enough to be there when we launched at Frito-Lay, when I was part of PepsiCo, uh, launched Cool Ranch Doritos. You probably have heard of those. So I was the guy who launched Cool Ranch Doritos. And I can remember telling my team time and time again that there's two or three times in your career you're going to have an opportunity to be part of something like this. Don't leave anything on the table. Maximize this opportunity. And let this, be, let this be one of those experiences that we can go back and talk about time and again throughout our careers. You know, so it's, it's seizing that moment and convincing people that you are, in fact, building something special. And then also this teacher mindset, veterans passing on knowledge, is another uh, key aspect of, uh, of, a, of a, positive, uh, you know, a positive culture and a positive mindset. Now, I want to bring up a specific example. 
I think an excellent example of this are the, uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. You know, and this, this emanates right from the top of the organization, this attitude. You've got, um, you know, right now, Bill DeWitt the third is the president of the organization, a third generation owner. Uh, his father, Bill DeWitt Jr., um, was a St. Louis Browns bat boy uh, back in the 40s and is, is now, uh, you know, is now the, the chairman of, of the St. Louis Cardinals. And the mindset that the DeWitts seem to carry is that they are stewards, yes, they're owners, but they are stewards and trustees of the St. Louis Cardinals for the city of St. Louis and its fan base. And, and, and then you, you go to the next level where, you know, you, I've, I heard a couple of, it's funny, the Cardinals were the one team that came up consistently in my interviews. By, I don't think I ever, I don't think I talked to any player who ever played for the Cardinals, so, but they always were referenced as an organization that might really have sort of an inside track on a lot of the things we're talking about today. And Red Shane Deese, right, who Shane Deese played mostly in the 50s uh, as a Cardinal middle infielder. Uh, and, and Shane Deese has been prominently uh, around the Cardinal organization for the better part of 60 years. And, and he is uh, credited with, with sort of architecting the Cardinal way. I'm not sure exactly what the Cardinal way is, but it seems to be something that is talked about and resonates. You know, they do have the second most championships in MLB history, so they have probably one of the most storied pasts of any baseball team. And you get the sense in their organization that they are continuously building something special. And you see what happens when they bring people up from the minor leagues. And when I talk to people who know guys who are call-ups, even the call-ups acted as if they weren't just playing for themselves, they were playing for something much, much bigger. They clearly embraced the whole teacher mindset where character veterans, whether it's Carpenter uh, or, or Wainwright or, or some of the others, uh, pass on their knowledge to, to the younger players. And the other thing, they have no tolerance for disruptions to team chemistry. We have seen many a player go, go out the door, and I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that every trade they've made in the last five years or 10 years is because of team chemistry, but there's a strong sense that team chemistry is a distinct decision variable in who you bring into the organization and who you send out of the organization. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this page because it's still very much work in progress, but I'm sort of creating this notion, which I think makes intuitive sense, and is fairly logical, that there is some sort of life cycle here. So when you're a rookie, and you're a call up, or you're trying to make the club, you know, as, as, one, as one front office guy said to me, yeah, we can get guys to buy into the team concept, but they first wanna make the team. So when you think of it that way, it's pretty hard to ask the guy striving to make the club and earn a, earn a career as a baseball player um, to have him be a contributor to team chemistry. Doesn't mean he's a, he, he's a drain, he might be a neutral factor, but he's probably not a, a team leader or a catalyst. Although, uh, you know, just recently at the uh, uh, MIT Analytics Conference, uh, Jeff Luno was on a panel with me, and Jeff was saying how Jose Altuve at age 23, and again, a very young team, so there is a void of veterans, has stepped up and has really taken over as the leader of the team. And, and now you could argue that Altuve's had such a great start to his career that he's, he's past this sort of rookie call-up phase anyway, so I don't know that that refutes this, but he is probably an exception. Um, as you move through and you become a more secure young player, you're, you're still, you know, okay, now you're a major leaguer, but you're still perhaps uh, consumed with what are you gonna make in your arbitration years, right? And that's a big deal. Now we're talking about guys who make, you know, 1.4 million in their arbitration years and guys who make 9 million in their arbitration year, in the first year of arbitration eligible. So we're talking about playing for some pretty high stakes, but you do begin to see players perhaps making the, uh, making the transition and, making the, and turning the corner. Then you get into this third phase where you're approaching free agency. And here it seems like, like you've got um, really a couple of different trajectories. You've got players who are um, fight, still fighting for roster spots. You've got players who have established themselves securely as a role player. And then you've got those that are chasing big bucks as a big name free agent, perhaps. And of, of those three groups, perhaps the group in the middle who's secure as a role player might be the candidates even at a young age, relatively young age, to be, to be candidates to really be a catalyst for team chemistry. And then when you get to the, to the veteran stage, you're, you're really talking about players who have, um, you know, 
are in a better position to embrace team, have a lot more knowledge to pass on. As one guy said, it's hard for, for, for one of these younger guys to be a teacher, right? So the veterans are the more logical guys who are going to be the teachers and take the younger players under their wing. But there's also this aspect, I think, of, of you know, think about Carlos Beltran today. You know, he's, he's really made his, made his money. He's, he's established himself as a top player. He's gotten a great reputation now as being a teacher of young players. And it, it, sort, of fits the, it sort of fits the life stage, right? He's, he's, it's, he's giving something back to a game that has been tremendously uh, good for him and, and given him a, a great life. So, but you know, life cycle is only one factor. So I don't mean to imply that the only team chemistry catalysts come from certain life cycles. Because there's another factor here too, right? It's the player personality type. So a player's aptitude for being a catalyst is not just dependent on stage, but also on some basic personality attributes in his psychological and emotional profile. You know, how well does it relate to others? What are some of the characteristics of his early childhood and family? Is he extroverted? Does he have the aptitude for leadership? Does he have a teacher mindset? Uh, you know, is, is he, is he, does he value passing on knowledge? So those are all things that are independent of the cycle that he's in, but I think are certainly relevant as to whether or not he is going to materialize into a guy who can really help your clubhouse and, or help turn it around. Um, this is probably, I think, I don't know if it's my most important page, but I think it's an important point here. If you start to think about how a lot of the different words and concepts I talked about today begin to fit together into an architecture, here, here's what I would suggest. I would say that um, these, these four factors on the left, accountability, trust, belief in team, and, and communication, are very much a foundation of team chemistry. The foundation, I don't know if I'd go that far, a foundation of, of clubhouse chemistry. But, but I think that they fit together and lead to something that I'm going to call confidence. And, I don't mean confidence simply as an attitude. I mean confidence as an entire mindset. Okay? Think of confidence as your belief in your ability or your team's ability to affect, affect a positive outcome. That's what I mean by confidence. So it's a mindset. It's not just you know, being, being boisterous or, or, or being you know, bold and saying, I can do this. It's a true belief, a genuine belief in your ability to affect a positive outcome. So what happens is, that leads to a whole set of actions, behaviors, and investments. Okay, we're, you know, we're rational people, even, even baseball players. And, and when we feel we have a chance to succeed, we double down. We are more dedicated to being our best. We even elevate the image of who we think we can be. We tend to be more collaborative because the environment's more supportive. So what you tend to get is working harder, you know, narrowing the gap, and I think even narrowing the gap between performance and potential. So, so we, we not only, I could argue, and some, some of the interview subjects I had argued this, not only do you get closer to your potential, but when you have that confidence and that support around you, that you probably expand your potential. So I had, I had a guy tell me, he said, I didn't just play better when I was on great teams, I became a better player when I was on great teams. I mean, I became a better player permanently because I learned things that I never would have taken the time to learn had I not been motivated by being on a great team. So again, you know, let, let's not forget, we're still here talking in the realm of, of concepts. We're not talking in the realm of measurement. I don't expect everyone to, to take everything I'm saying here and, and, and bank it and say that, well, gee, this is, that's great. I'm glad I know how, how life works now. But, but I do think that these principles make a lot of intuitive sense. But you know, you're, you're a better ball player because you're open to more advice and coaching, you watch more video, you work harder and smarter in the weight room, uh, and, and so forth. So um, you know, obviously this doesn't happen to every player in a good clubhouse, but it, it can. So as we get sort of towards the, uh, towards the end here of a few more pages, if I had to sort of talk about a tale of two clubhouses, you know, you can sort of gaze at this and read this. Uh, you know, on the left, players inspiring each other, providing psychological support, emotional support. Uh, this is really a summary of a lot of the things I've already said. You know, in terms of some of the more tangible things that I heard people say happen in good clubhouses is players playing through minor injuries. Um, and, and it was, I had 
several players tell me there is absolutely no question that in a great clubhouse, players feel, I had one player tell me, I went out hurt so often, not, not to hurt to where I was hurting the team, but things that I was nicked up and just didn't feel like I was 100%, but I knew that at 85%, and my manager knew that I was better than what we had behind me, and I never thought twice about it because I felt a sense of obligation to my teammates. Uh, you know, versus the, he said, I've seen guys in teams with clubhouse chemistry's not so great, can't wait for a day off, angling for a day off at any turn. Uh, players missing signs, you know, conveniently perhaps, or not, or just not engaged when you're, when you're not in a, in a clubhouse that's positive. Lack of plate discipline, just chasing stuff for two reasons. One, you want to get through it, and two, uh, you, 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 want to, you don't want to take the walk, you want to put up your stats because you're playing for yourself. N not recognizing, perhaps, that we all, we all in this room value walks a lot. But, but anyway, uh, you know, so, so basically just wanting to put the ball in play and chasing bad pitches versus plate discipline. I had one guy tell me that, you know, I've seen outfielders not dive after fly balls that were sort of borderline, should I dive or not, because the, sort of that risk reward of, do I make the catch versus perhaps a rib or some other injury, it's just not worth it on a bad chemistry team. So when you start to hear things like that, it, it's hard to not, you know, to not be a believer. The, 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 one of the last other, I guess my second favorite point besides the confidence point is why this is much more important today than it ever was 20 years ago. And, and I do think that team chemistry has a lot more leverage today with, with the player. And I think it's simply because we're in an age of, age of empowerment. So if you could really make a player feel great in 1964, I, I, my sense is they would, they would try harder and they would be all gung-ho and, you know, that might, and maybe they would learn one more thing about themselves and that would take their, their performance up a notch. Today, with, with, with the internet, with the kind of information out there, think of what a motivated player can do in terms of, you know, tapping into team resources on all these things, but even on their own, information on nutrition and diet, strength and flexibility re regimens, access to video, diving into hit FX and pitch FX data. I mean, for some, you have to be pretty motivated to want to do this stuff because there's so much out there today. And the other thing is, I remember, um, you know, a guy telling me, I, every time a pitching co a starting pitcher saying, every time a pitching coach uh, asked me to do something differently, I'd always ask why. And, and this, this pitching coach he had hated that. But that's the culture today. We don't want to just be told what to do, especially the generation of people's, people in their, in their, you know, teens, 20s, and, 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 you know, 20s mostly, and some early 30s, which, which are the ball players. They really want to know why. So, so I think in an, with an empowered player, team chemistry has even more power in, in the organization. So again, here's a, uh, sort of to end with this, here's a, a, a rough framework. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go too far, you know, with this or put a, a lot of stock in this, but my sense is that accountability, trust, belief in team and communication are that foundation. Upon that, you build confidence, which sort of relates in some way to motivation and empowerment. Again, I'm not sure I got all the boxes in the right place, but in the end, it sort of triggers into realizing individual and, uh, and, and team potential. So where I am on this now is I want to continue my interviews uh, with players, managers, office, uh, front office guys, and, and coaches. And I, I think, I think uh, you know, I frankly think measuring team chemistry is actually fairly easy. I think understanding how it's, how it's generated and its components is a whole different thing. And understanding the individual role in team chemistry is, is, a tough, is a tough thing. But I was measuring the organizational climate of my Pepsi team in, in, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, sent out, we, we developed an organizational health survey. It's very, it's very simple and very straightforward. It'd be very di a very different look, and it would have to be a, a two-minute version, I think, for a ball player. But it's easily done, I think, in 10, 12, questions. Uh, but back, I can remember when we uh, launched a new product and my org health scores went from uh, my, at a 5,000 person uh, Pepsi organization at the time, bottling business in the Midwest, and we went from an, you know, an 81 to an 88 in, in, the, in the two weeks after we launched a new product. Everybody was jazzed up and excited, and then it would ebb and flow. So you can measure the climate, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the psychological and emotional temperature of your, of your organization. But, but I think... Um, you know, I think doing something with that, you know, is where it gets tricky. 
and, and also dissecting it and, and understanding root causes is where it also gets tricky. But you know, what, what you might expect to see is in, a, is in an environment where there's strong team chemistry, you might expect um, an eight game losing streak or a six game losing streak to drive the organizational climate survey down by less, right? You might expect a, a narrower band of scores, if you will, on how a, a team was functioning interpersonally with, with the wild ebb and flows of the baseball season. That's, again, just a hypothesis. So um, that's, really, uh, that's really my take, and I'd love to, uh, love to answer some questions. Uh, we're going to use the microphone. So wherever he goes, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, Vince, I haven't read, uh, I know you, you indicated you were going to do some sampling of uh, management or other kind of industrial circumstances pertaining to uh, good chemistry of a business. I haven't read the uh, Ted Wells report, but I, I would imagine that the Miami Dolphins present an almost classic example of bad team chemistry, almost uh, at an infinitely bad situation. Uh, in that regard, are you going to look at things like how internal leadership emerges, whether it emerges as a result of, of, of some sort of top-down delegation or whether it organically emerges within the organization? Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, you know, I think p part of the answer to your question of whether I'll examine that has, has to do with access, right? So. So it depends if I, if I have any kind of access of that nature. But I, I will say that what you saw there was, was uh, tolerance at a management level of a set of behaviors and a whole culture that I wonder how different it is from the rest of the NFL, frankly. Uh, but, but that aside, uh, I mean, I think it's that extremely macho culture. My sense is, you know, more macho than, uh, you know, than, than what we see in baseball. I'm not saying by a lot, but I, but I do think uh, it's, a, it's a unique culture, and it might, be more, it might be more widespread within football. And whether, but I do think that leadership from the top down, uh, I'm not saying that you can always implement and infiltrate from the top down, but the top has to set the tone. It's sort of the necessary, but not sufficient, right? It's necessary for the top to sort of set the tone, but that alone won't carry the day. Yes? You said um, strong evidence that team chemistry can be an integral part of winning, but I didn't hear any evidence that it can be a cause of winning. Isn't it as, just as likely that good team chemistry is the result of winning? Well, I had that discussion with folks. I mean, I certainly don't know empirically, but I did have the discussion with folks, and there was the belief that, um, and this was consistent, that winning helped team chemistry but by a much, had much smaller impact on it than team chemistry had on winning. Now again, I'm talking to players who are in the middle of it and have their own biases in terms of the way they view and interpret this. So um, there have been a lot of winning teams who can't stand each other and are very dysfunctional too. So I, I you know, I'm, I am being uh, pushed to believe that of that equation, which is circular, no doubt, there's a, there's a, a circular effect, that the more pronounced effect is, is, the, is the effect that team chemistry has on performance. Now, adjusting for talent. Adjusting for talent. I'll say it one more time, adjusting for talent. Because, you know, we're not going to take, the, the, you're not going to take a 64-win team and make them great. Uh, you can take a 93-win team and make them really lousy with bad team chemistry, but you can't go, I don't think you can go the other way around, so. Where's the mic? Uh, so how much do you think we can look into how team chemistry affects winning teams? So what do you think we can accomplish by researching team chemistry? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not really, I'm not really that um, focused on the, on the link between, on measuring the link between team chemistry and team performance. I, I know that may sound strange, but that's not really, I, I think I could get there, but I think we're so far short of that right now. I'm more interested in understanding 
how team chemistry is created. Okay? And this is only scratching the surface. So I'd rather study, I, I'd rather, I, I'm, I'm fine with taking it on faith, not everybody else might not be, but that, that there is a positive impact. I'm more interested in the ingredients into creating team chemistry than I am in the payoff at the end. I'm willing to make a leap of faith that there's some payoff there. It's not like I think we, you know, we have to know that to, to, the, to the second decimal because there's a you know, $30 million investment to create chemistry. I just want to know what's really, what's really the ingredients of creating chemistry. Once we get through that, I think we can worry more about you know, the literal translation to its impact on team performance. But you're going to have to adjust for talent level, so that's always going to make it tricky. Where's the mic? Vince, I was wondering in the interviews that you conducted with players, and especially the ones that were in locker rooms that didn't have great team chemistry, did they ever take, and depending on what their role was on that particular team, did they ever take it upon themselves or things take it upon themselves to set the tone for the team as far as, well, if they, if they said their teammates you know, weren't coming in early or they had a bad locker room, did they say, well, maybe I should be the one that trying to start this trend to try to get team chemistry back higher up? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Michael. I mean, there was one, one fellow talked about an attempt in that direction, and pretty quickly it became a task that was way bigger than him. And he recognized he also had to you know, be competent at what he was doing every day and playing. And so without four or five or six other guys and a manager and a coaching staff supporting that, it was, it was a little too lonely and too much of an uphill battle to do on, it, on his own. Now, that might have been a situation where they weren't at the break point of being positive versus negative. They were so far negative. But that was the answer I got. Who's got the mic? Yeah. John. Vince, I, in looking at, I think you did a, I agree totally with your model of team chemistry, at least I think you're 90% there. But the one thing I think you've minimized is the role of the manager in creating that chemistry. And is that something that stands out in your interviews? And possibly as a follow-up, look at to what Tori, Russo, Bobby Cox, even with Joe Madden, what they do, they dip different approaches, but they seem to create teams that have that team chemistry. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that because I certainly don't mean to minimize, uh, I, I was trying to say it several times that the front office and the manager, the manager in particular play a key role, but I want to emphasize that the manager alone can't do it if he's saddled with three or four really tough guys who just don't want to be part of the whole thing, and they can sabotage it. So, so good managers can be sabotaged, but I, I agree. I don't think, I mean, it's hard to imagine it happening without a manager who facilitates it. But, but I don't think that's sufficient, is the way I'd describe it. You had mentioned earlier about how players making positive comments about their teammates in the media is, is uh, seen as a, a good thing for team chemistry. Do you, do you think you'll take into, a, into account any consideration of where like a team like the Mets or the Yankees, where they have so much media that they have to deal with versus a team like maybe the Royals where they only have one beat writer, where there's a lot of demands put on these players in regards to making comments and for these uh, reporters digging for information where that could possibly have an effect as well on team chemistry. Sure. I ha haven't thought about that one way or the other, but, but just the sheer volume of media and the ability to deal with that and what you might say under those circumstances could vary in gr greatly in those markets. Yeah, yeah. Your earlier comments alluded to this a little bit, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, some opponents of team chemistry will look at the mid-70s Oakland A's and the late 70s New York Yankees. They won multiple world championships. They did not seem to have much in common with some of the points on the slides there. They fought with each other, the owners, the managers, etc. What's your response to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, this is when, when one uh, team executive said to me, talent, team chemistry is very important. We really strive for it and talent at a certain level will trump it. It will trump it. I mean, um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know anything about the Dodgers clubhouse. I'm not here to comment on it. But the Dodgers have the kind of talent that perhaps could be insulated from anything like this. And maybe they have great team chemistry. But even if they didn't, uh, the kind of talent that's in that clubhouse, it's, it's on another level. 
So, you know, I think that you're going to find those, those situations where it's, it's just not, it's just not going to come into play. I think when you're talking about, you know, two teams that are, that are in the, you know, 83 to 88 win range, and one of them has great team chemistry and the other doesn't, I'm going to bet on the one that has great team chemistry if the talent's equal. Vince, last question. Okay. Yeah, Vince, right? one last, last question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My last question would, oh, Vince, over here. Just, did you look at cross, it's interesting that you bring up the Dodgers in particular, just because I'd be interested in, like, whether or not you looked at cross-racial or cross-cultural differences, and also how you foster, again, good team chemistry across those kinds of lines. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question, Christina. I, I, I really started out with that as a, as a major um, vein, vein to go down. And uh, for, for better or worse, in my early conversations with players, I, I found that whole topic area being minimized, meaning that, gee, it's, there's the cultural thing, I mean, it's just not a factor in the game today. There's, there's you know, uh, and, and I would have thought that seeing sort of cultural pockets forming might be a barrier to good team chemistry. But, you know, um, I, I don't think I'm out of school by saying, you know, Rico Bronia, who was one of my interview subjects, uh, played in, in the Mexican League, and uh, this was a while back, and he said there were, there were three, I think, other Americans on his team. They were immediately embraced, had zero issue assimilating, and, and that was just, that's a reverse example of him going down there. But the people I talked to said that Latin players on the team today, uh, you know, there seems to be a, a high degree of uh, camaraderie that's, that's, that's in, independent of, uh, of ethnicity or, or race. Well, thanks so much for your attention and another... Uh, <laughs>